What's up world, Jeff Lerner here. And in this video, we are talking about millionaire habits. Uh, we're gonna take a look at what it is that wealthy people do, successful people do, um, that especially are the habits that drive their behavior. We're not gonna talk about things like uh, they play you know, polo and they, they supper at the country club. Those are things they started doing after they were rich. We're talking about the things that they did daily that helped them to get rich and to be successful. And this is not just my opinion, this is actually based on a five-year study by a guy named Thomas Corley, who actually documented his research, wrote a series of books. Uh, one of them is called Change Your Habits, Change Your Life. And uh, I'm going to share with you his research. And again, I happen to agree with all of this. I actually do a lot of this stuff. I was pleased to find out that I my habits are pretty consistent with successful people's habits. And I would say that a lot of my success has been uh, because of my habits. But anyway, again, this is not just one person's experience. This is documented research based on a lot of successful people. Uh, again, by a guy named Thomas Corley. If you want more in-depth analysis of this, get his book, Change Your Habits, Change Your Life. Okay, so uh, if you don't want to read the book, Change Your Habits, Change Your Life, then you can just watch this video and I'm gonna tell you the habits that it talks about, most of them, I left out some of them. By choosing to watch this video, instead of reading the book, you are actually not participating in the first habit. It's the very first habit that he talks about, which is millionaires read consistently. Millionaires, in fact, read books like Change Your Habits, Change Your Life consistently. There's actually three types of books that millionaires read. Uh, the average millionaire reads uh, at least 30 minutes a day, and they tend to focus on three types of books. One is biographies of successful people. Successful people, not surprisingly, they read a lot of self-help or personal development books. Uh, one of my favorite development guys, T. Harv Eker, always says, hey, I'd rather be uh, rich and hokey or rich and corny than poor and cool and a lot of people are you know think that self-help is kind of lame or they're too cool for it or whatever successful wealthy people actually are really into improving themselves and they're not like too embarrassed to go buy you know at the bookstore secrets of the millionaire mind or think and grow rich or awaken the giant within or whatever and that's one of the three types of books that they read quite a bit of and then the third one is actually history books they say uh, those who do not know their history are destined to repeat it the history of humankind is generally a history of wars shadiness poor decision making chaos a lot of trauma and that uh, and some cool stuff too but in all cases I think that we better ourselves by learning more about what's come before us so that we do not repeat the mistakes of people past um, and that ideally we can repeat or duplicate the good decisions which is again why we study successful people successful people biographies uh, history books and um, self-help and personal development those are the three categories of books we're not taught we're not reading a ton of fiction we're not reading lots of adventure stories we're not reading a lot of you know romance novels no like intentional reading to make yourself better and then the next thing this probably isn't going to shock you they exercise consistently the average millionaire does uh, at least 30 minutes a day of some sort of cardiovascular stimulating exercise and that doesn't just mean running or totally like purely aerobic exercise but it does mean something that gets their heart rate up you know a lot of like lifting weights would actually qualify too as long as you're doing it at sufficient intensity and pace that it it raises your heart rate there is something really important about raising your heart rate um, in terms of some cognitive benefits too not just uh, aerobic benefits in the body the next thing that he talks about in the book is that they are very, very discriminating about their relationships. Uh, they're not discriminating from the standpoint, of, I gotta be careful with my words, they're not discriminating. They're not like being discriminatory. I'm saying they're very choosy about who they get into relationships with. Wealthy people tend to recognize the truth of the, the adage that you are the average of the people that you hang out with. And also, um, you know, I think you kind of got to begin with the end in mind when it comes to choosing your friends. A lot of times, you know, it, it's it's important to act as if. In my 20s, I was 
I was a musician and I, I love being a musician. I love hanging out with, with uh, creative people, sort of non-traditional people, had a lot of fun, grew a lot as a person. But I definitely reached a point where my aspirations, my, my, my life goals were different than the circle that I was around. I had those goals before I had the results and a big part of the shift from being somebody that just wanted the thing to actually somebody that was doing the things that would lead to getting the thing that I wanted was changing uh, and starting to, to be around people that were frankly in, in line with what I wanted. They wanted more money, they wanted more choice and freedom and opportunity and they helped me realize that wanting a higher standard, a higher quality of life didn't make me greedy it didn't make me uh, like a you know like a money grubbing person. It made me. Uh, it's because I realized that you only get one shot on this this merry-go-round called life. You only get one opportunity. I sound like an Eminem song. Frankly, what you're able to do with that opportunity is largely going to be determined by your resources. And I got around people who were like, "Yeah, this is a resource game. We're all playing the same game. There's just some of us that accept the game for what it is, and then some of us that have a lot of emotional baggage that." messes us up in in you know playing the game objectively and rationally and i started getting around people that were really objective about the game and played it well and suddenly my life changed right it, it's a huge predictor of your your future results is your present uh, your present environment primarily the people the people around you and wealthy people get that they're very very again discriminating about their relationships uh and this was actually something really interesting i took from the book that i hadn't really thought about um, but it's, it found a lot of commonality between really successful people. One of the things that's very common between really, among really successful people is that they volunteer. And I was like, oh, volunteering? Well, yeah, they, they, you know, they're successful and they want to give back. And it actually, um, the way the book presented it, though, again, it was not an effect. It was a cause. So it wasn't that they got successful, they made a bunch of money and they felt this altruistic desire to pay forward their good fortune and so they started volunteering and being charitable. It was actually that volunteering was part of how they became successful because when you volunteer, you start networking. You start, typically volunteering is a group activity. You're, you're working with other people who are volunteering too. You know, I say this all the time and it's not, it's not maybe politically correct, but there's really nothing more selfish than poverty. Right, and, and it's because by necessity, as a function of survival, if you're poor, you have to be self-interested self at least. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to be self-absorbed or even selfish per se, but you, you have to be very, very focused on your self-interest because there's just not extra resources. There's not abundance. There's nothing, to go, there's nothing else to go around. There's nothing to give. You have to be constantly fixated on your own survival and your own next step. And it's all me, me, me uh, when there's not enough, right? <laughs> And so if you volunteer, if you get around people that are now, that are you know, spending their time and money giving, um, you're generally spending time around people who have an abundance mindset, an abundance perspective, and people who tend to have an abundance perspective very often also have an abundance existence, right? Um, so you, know, you can argue whether it's uh, the, the chicken or the egg, doesn't really matter. The fact is charitable, abundant, living tends to correlate with wealth and I think it is both the chicken and the egg. Wealthy people do a lot of volunteering as a function or as a, as a component of their networking. And, and actually since I read that I was like, man, if I really think about who are the people in my life that tend to sort of stimulate my forward progress business-wise, not just as a good person but like actually in terms of business, they're people that I have connected to through things like uh, like I'll use one relationship, for example, somebody that I met through an activity at my kid's school. Interestingly, there weren't that many dads that were able to participate in that activity. Most dads are at, at work at a job and they're not able to get away. I was I was able to be there and um, not not surprisingly, some of the, the, the men that were able to be there, you know, and this isn't my sexist patriarchal perspective. This was just the reality of my kid's class was that the men that were there participating were people that were self-employed and successful, right? And so I think about that as a networking relationship and how it's led to other other possibilities and other, you know, prosperity in my life. It's just volunteering is a thing that tends to kind of put you in a in a rising tide situation because of the people around you. Um, the next one is dreamscaping. And that's not actually the word he uses. I think the word he used was like dream sketching or dream visioning or something. Um, but dreamscaping is a term I've always used. And basically what it means is think about landscaping, right? Landscaping is like, landscaping isn't creating land. It's 
manicuring land. It's it's maneuvering and engineering and structuring uh, aesthetically and artistically the land. You're scaping the land of like your yard or whatever. Well, doing the same thing with your future, right? It's, it's like painting and, and orienting and structuring your future in very specific and vivid terms. So like landscaping, a landscaper comes in and like does fine detail work, right? They, they trim the hedge, they edge the curve, they, you know, they snip and they manicure and they're precise. It's getting that level of detail, that sort of granularity um, and that specificity about your future and about really architecting your picture of your, your ideal future so that you have very clear targets to aim for in your life. Um, that's something that really successful people do. They believe, first of all, there's an inherent belief that the future is something that they can actually influence, uh, if not outright control, they can at least have influence, they can have impact on what their future is gonna look like. And from that belief, they actually take the time to define the impact that they wanna have in very specific terms. That's called dreamscaping. And it's something that wealthy people tend to do a lot of. And then you get into some kind of mechanical things like successful people actually get enough sleep at night. Probably not a big shocker. You could probably argue, well, yeah, they have the luxury too because they're not working three jobs or whatever. But uh, I will say from experience and, you know, when I was a musician, my schedule was all messed up because I was working till three, four or five o'clock in the morning sometimes. Um, getting enough sleep helps you operate from a stable, sane, uh, consistent and disciplined place that will over time, I think, pays a, a certain type of compound return in your life of just consistent, good decision making uh, and directional living. Wealthy people get up early. That may not seem like a surprise to you, but as much as it's obvious, I find a lot of people don't actually practice it, tend to get up between four and five every morning. Um, and uh, the, the final two that I'll mention, and I'm gonna to try to wrap this video up, frankly, because the place where I'm shooting is closing and I need to hurry. Um, the final two that I'll mention is one is the, the average wealthy person before they made a million dollars, they had three sources of income. Really think about that. Greater than majority of wealthy people, they didn't develop multiple sources of income after they made a million dollars. They, they had on average three sources of income during the run up to becoming, you know, statistically wealthy. And again, I'm using the term made to make a million dollars, but uh, frankly, in this day and age, a million dollars isn't even really wealthy for most people, depending on where you live. Um, and that's critical because a lot of people think that they'll start investing once they have money or, there's, or they'll start diversifying once they have money. Um, it's, it's actually the, the people who work a job and start a business and even do investing. So they're investing and running a business on the side and working a job. That's the formula, multiple streams of income. I can certainly say myself, uh, no exception, that you know when I finally actually kind of turned the corner or crested the hill or whatever you want to call it of, of having discretionary disposable income and you know being what people would consider affluent, I had like four things going at once um, at that time. And then the final thing, and this I'm glad he said this because I think it's, I've noticed it, but I've never actually heard somebody put a fine point on it. Successful people have good manners. They have good manners and good etiquette. They know how to sit at a table. They know how to conduct themselves. They know how to speak articulately. They don't use a lot of slang. And frankly, and not to sound like an old guy, I'm 40 years old, probably gonna sound it here in a minute, but you hear a lot how a lot of young people speak now and it does not serve you. It does not serve you. And for reasons that I do not have time to go in, you know, to expound on fully in this video, but like, the opportunities that you want to access, the doors that you want to open, the capital that you want to can, you know, get access to, to build your dreams and fund your dreams, the people that can network you and connect you. And they don't want to hear poor speech patterns and slangy speech habits. It's like, it sounds hokey. Like we're not talking about Emily Post finishing school level refinement. We're just talking about basic stuff like not slurping your drink. And, and I mean, Thomas Gorley goes into this uh, in the book, he talks about manners and etiquette. And it may sound like such a trivial thing, but I, I think it, it comes down to, you know, one of my favorite sayings, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And just having the respect, the self-respect and the standards and the commitment to being better than average. I think so many of us, uh, again, the place I'm at is closing because I don't have time to like go off on this in my usual robust fashion, but like, so many of us are scared to just say, I'm gonna be better than average. I'm not gonna be like everybody else. I'm not gonna be like most people. Most people are gonna be here and I'm gonna be up here. I'm gonna to choose to be up here. That doesn't mean I'm arrogant. It doesn't mean I'm condescending. 
It doesn't mean I think I'm better than people. It means I'm simply choosing to come up here. And up here is different. And up here is, is it how a different class of people behave and conduct themselves and the choices they make and the behaviors and the habits um, and the decisions. And I want what they have, so I'm gonna do what they do. And if that makes me different or makes me alienated or, or isolated or ostracized from my current circle or my friends or what, I mean, and again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying this uh, in a vacuum. I, I do a lot of coaching. I work with a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs. And usually, like, I would say the biggest thing, like probably 80% of the battle for most people is changing their mentality, which very often means changing their environment in terms of people. Um, and kind of just holding themselves to a higher standard than the standard that they've been held to up to that point. And typically, the standard that you're held to is defined by the people around you. And if you want to level up your standards, you got to be the one to hold yourself to higher standards, which is usually going to mean kind of going, you know, ideally, you reach down and try to lift people up too. But if they don't want to come, that's on them. Anyways, hey, if you're into this stuff, if you if you want to have a better life, if you want to like level up your life and change some of the inputs to maybe change some of the outputs, I encourage you to subscribe to my channel. That's what I'm all about. I'm, I have dedicated my life to studying success, to embodying success. I am not one of those people who's embarrassed to say I have left many behind, below, whatever the term would be. I have chosen a higher standard for myself and I've... Uh, generated some results from that and I, I use my channel as a place to share what's worked for me because it might work for you. So uh, subscribe if you want to learn more and I appreciate your viewing of my video. I'll see you on the next one.